thought they were doing the right thing and perhaps things didn't turn out as well as everyone hoped. The first example that always comes to mind is Robert E. Lee's cavalry commander, James Ewell Brown Stewart, 30 years old, 31 years old. Uh, everyone's familiar with the story. His cavalry becomes uh, uh, out of touch. He, he goes on a raid around the, Confederate, around the Federal Army. There, there are many reasons for this, but bottom line is he's given discretionary orders. He exercises his discretion. He suddenly finds himself with the Union Army between himself and Lee's army. And his job is to screen Lee's army. So now he's either got to, he's got these wagons that he has just apprehended up at Rockville and he doesn't want to leave go of his prize because foraging is an important part of the campaign. So he now realizes that the Federal Army for some odd reason is moving quickly. It's because they've changed commanders and Meade has now energized the Union Army. So, so Stewart's problem is I, I either have to turn around and go behind Meade and, and link up with Lee, who's up in the Shenandoah Valley someplace heading for Pennsylvania, or I go to Pennsylvania, because that's where I know Lee is going. And so I always ask when I'm having a discussion on this point, so what would you do if it was your call to make and your steward? And most, most people who have thought about this say, well, you know, what I would do is I'd go to Pennsylvania, because that's the shortest route. And, and the most certain probability of finding the boss is, in, is finding Lee up in Pennsylvania. So what we find is here's Stewart, who, who's showing initiative, exercises a certain amount of, uh, of initiative, and, and carries his cavalry force into a situation that he probably should not have been in. But that's impetuosity. So now he's there. Now, now you've got to correct that. And, and again, he makes a decision based on what he thinks is good, good information. It doesn't turn out so good because for the critical first two days of the Battle of Gettysburg, Robert E. Lee does not have the benefit of the eyes of his cavalry. And so sometimes ingenuity and impetuosity can get you into a lot of uh, difficulty. And sometimes even making good decisions for what you think are the right reasons can later prove to be not to have been such good decisions. Does that mean that the decisions themselves were not good in and of themselves? Context is important. Here's another one. On the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, Again, to use an example from the Confederate side, because they're carrying the initiative, Robert E. Lee decides on the second day that he is going to strike the Union Army in position. And his senior subordinate, James Longstreet, doesn't want to do this. Longstreet argues that rather than trying to move south of the Federal force and, and roll up their line, let's, let's maneuver around behind their force. And Lee says, no, no, I, 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 I want to strike the enemy because he's there. And and Longstreet, who has seen the power of defensive positions at Fredericksburg six months prior, he's not at all interested in attacking that, that strong Union position. But Lee is not interested in having Jack, uh, Longstreet maneuver because if Longstreet maneuvers, he's thinking to himself, you know, Meade, Meade's not an inanimate object upon whom I work my will. Clausewitz says your opponent is a dynamic opponent. It's like the wrestling match. And Lee has to worry that if I allow Longstreet to maneuver and, and Meade attacks, I could, I could be in a very bad situation because the bulk of the Federal Army will attack a part of mine and then can turn and attack the other. No, no, says Lee, there's the enemy and there we'll strike him. Now at that point, and this is always a great discussion with war college students because the simple question is, at that point, if the commander has decided, what are you supposed to do? And the answer is always, well, you follow orders. Yes, but what if you believe the order is not illegal, immoral, or unethical? but wrong. Napoleon said the general who carries out an order he knows to be wrong is a criminal. Are you a criminal? No. No. You're not supposed to substitute your judgment for that of your boss, but, but you feel you have a responsibility to him, to the men, to the cause. Maybe your boss is not seeing things clearly. So he comes back and he argues, General Lee, let's, let's not Let's not do that flank attack. Let's take the whole army, get up on a hill between the Federal Army and Washington and make them attack us. Again, Lee says, no, there's the enemy and there we'll strike him. And Longstreet, at that point, has no recourse. Or, or does he? What Longstreet actually does is, is, having received the order, he starts to maneuver with a portion of his force. And the last thing that Lee told him before Jackson, with his two divisions, starts Longstreet, <laughs> with the two divisions, starts to maneuver 
do not be seen by the federal force. I want you to get into position as Jackson was at Chancellorsville without being seen. So, so Longstreet takes off with the two divisions and starts to maneuver, and as he starts to maneuver, he gets to a point south of the battlefield, near Black Horse Tavern, where if he crosses a ridge, the semaphore station up on Little Round Top will observe him. And he says to Lafayette McLaws, the division commander with whom he's riding, we can't go this way. We will be seen. And the, and the commander told us not to be seen as we maneuver, so we achieve surprise. So on his own authority, Longstreet will turn the column around, march all the way back to another concealed position where he can begin the approach anew. That's a good decision, except that Longstreet is part of a three-part plan. Longstreet maneuvers, General Ewell, another corps commander, is to launch a coordinated supporting attack, and General Hill is to be prepared to support both. When Longstreet begins to allow the plan to bog down, the timing to slow down, Lee's whole plan becomes unhinged. Eventually, Longstreet will get around, but by then, General Ewell is out of position. Longstreet's attack will go in, modestly successful. General Hill's attack sort of stumbles in, only partly successful. Meade is able to repulse both of those before General Ewell's attack comes in, so the attacks are uncoordinated. The second day turns out to be a victory for the Federals. At least they are not ejected from their position. Now, Longstreet's, Longstreet's conduct here, what is he doing? What, what he's trying to do, for what he thinks are good reasons, is to help his boss see the, the battle more clearly. In fact, what he is doing is he is actually interfering with the effectiveness of the plan. But he does it for what he believes are all the right reasons. And this is a great opportunity to have one of those discussions about how you see things depends on where you sit. You know, what level of command you're working at depends on, on how you discharge your duties. Robert E. Lee, as the Army commander, just like George Gordon Meade as the Army commander, really sees the battle or the context in three dimensions. They see the tactical context, the enemy to their front, the operational context, what brought you here, and what's going to get you away from here at the end, and then the strategic context, what is the outcome and, and what are the implications. Lee's decision to attack on the third day, that's clearly done in the context of the, the strategy that brought us here, demanded that we achieve some sort of military victory in order to get a political settlement. You don't win victories by marching away. So you have that discussion about what level, what level is the general working at and how are those levels different? And sometimes you as a tactical commander will violently disagree with the decision because you don't understand the operational context or a strategic context. And so perhaps an insight that, that, that Army War College students can get when they walk that battlefield is they have to remind themselves of this aphorism that they've all heard and they all know how you see things depends on where you sit. But to have an example that lets them bring that aphorism to life, that's useful.